Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to Burp Process Equipment's uh, educational webinar on pump lift stations. I'm Mark Trugenti, the Director of Design, Engineering, and Business Development for Burp Process Equipment. And I want to thank everyone for joining me this afternoon, um, especially taking time out of your day during this um, stressful uh, and difficult time. I do hope everyone is, is, is family and doing uh, well, and we can just take a break this afternoon to, uh, to go over uh, pump list stations. You know, we're going to look at a few different things today, such as uh, looking at some basics of like what a pump lift station is and some of the different configurations that are utilized with this system, um, as well as some basic applications before looking at a few standard products and then moving more into some customized lift stations that are utilized uh, in different various applications and really how lift stations can be customized uh, based on the different applications that they are used in. And we'll end off today talking a little bit about um, some, 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 some variations on the list stations, such as solvent list stations. This is kind of an open webinar, so if anybody has any questions, they can, they can certainly feel free to type them into the questions window. We will try to answer all questions while we're on the broadcast today. But if, they, but if some of them are missed, uh, we will email them out to you afterwards. Um, and there will be a follow-up survey. We'd be very interested to hear your feedback on this webinar, as well as topics you'd like to see in the future. So without further ado, uh, let's talk about pump list stations. So what is a pump lift station? A pump lift station is a device used to move solution from a lower to a higher elevation or from a location uh, where gravity flow is just not, it's just not possible um, or practical. And that comes up quite a bit, and I know there are definitely municipalities out there on different applications where obviously you don't want to insert a pump if possible because gravity um, certainly doesn't have any of the inherent risks uh, or points of failure that adding a lift station do. But in a lot of different applications, um, there is a need to add a pump lift station, whether it has to do with just the elevation of the drainage pipe, the need to transfer this to another application or system, um, if you're using it more on process side, or if it's a retrofit application where you're adding in a new space and it's not possible to tie into the gravity line, that's really where 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 pump lift stations um, are utilized. And they're utilized across really almost any um, different industry from the biofilm, the semiconductor, food processing, government applications, municipal applications use them quite a bit as transfer stations. Uh, in college and university laboratories as well. We're going to focus today primarily on um, lift stations, which are utilized more uh, for process waste as opposed to things that are used more for like sanitary waste. Um, although they do utilize a lot of the similar characteristics, some of the technologies that are utilized in them, such as the pumps, the instrumentations, um, those are a little bit different depending upon whether or not you, you know, you're moving more of a sanitary waste stream or you're using more of a process waste or just a process in general uh, for transfer because not all lift stations are, are solely utilized um, on a waste system. A lot of them are actually utilized uh, for transferring uh, bulk, you know, bulk chemical for use in an actual application. So. Let's talk about lift station basics here. Um, so, standard lift station, this is one of the big questions that comes up often is, you know, if I have a process, um, whether it be from a lab chase or from a floor, from an entire building, you know, how do you really size a lift station, um, both, you know, both the actual volume of the reservoir as well as the pump? And really, at its heart, a lift station is nothing more than a collection vessel with a set of with a pump or set of pumps on there which are then designed to collect and then transfer and then transfer the fluid to another point um, and it is in sizing that that really is the basics of a lift station design so lift stations need to be sized for the maximum amount of flow this is generally um, evident when looking at different plumbing codes for example um, because obviously if there is a surge of fluid, you obviously do not want your lift station or transfer station to overflow. So lift station is, is sized for the maximum flow. 
it's a little bit different than some of the other things you look at when talking about gravity systems where you apply like a diversity factor to it, for example. You look at saying, okay, I have say a hundred sinks in a building or something like that. And you want to look at saying, okay, I'm you know, inciting, you know, a process you say like a wastewater treatment system, you would look at approximately like a thirty percent diversity in those cases. For a lift station, you really can't do that. Um, because obviously you don't want the situation because it does ultimately stop the flow of gravity into your into your transfer station. So the lift station pumps need to be sized for the maximum inst instantaneous flow plus a factor of 10%. This allows you to always be pumping down your lift station, which is generally what you are trying to do. There are a few cases out there where you do want to actually maintain a level in the system, um, but those are usually for the purposes of doing specific design or, or, or specific processes that you're actually working on. The tank volume is a little bit more loose than the actual pump flow rate. Tank volume is dependent upon a few different things. Obviously, room constraint, how much room you have, whether this is going to be going into a pit, or on a floor, or under a sink, um, or in the ground. There's a lot of, you know, there's obviously definitely a, a room constraint factor that comes into play. Um, when sizing your tank, but generally you're really looking to not cycle the pumps. Um, that's really the principal thing you're looking at. And kind of a good rule of thumb is that your lift station tank volume should be sized for roughly a three to five minutes of residency time, which is for whatever your instantaneous flow rate is. So if your instantaneous flow rate is 50 GPM, you'd want to use a reservoir that's approximately 150 gallons if you're still using it just as a transfer station, not for some other purpose. That's kind of a good rule of thumb to follow. Some pumps, obviously, we'll talk about pump technologies here in a couple minutes, doesn't really matter so much on things like cycle time. And in a lot of, you know, smaller, more custom applications, that, you know, that kind of sizing is really more dictated by things like the actual, you know, room constraints or just how you're able to get that drain line into your actual process. The most basic lift stations are just fairly small simplex lift stations. And a simplex lift station is a single pump, single tank a unit. And they're generally fairly small. Simplex lift stations are generally utilized in applications um, where you're not so concerned about things like redundancy or you have very, very low flow. So it doesn't really matter if the actual flow going to your system is shut off for a given period of time. It may be being fed from a single tool or device, or maybe just a single lab sink. But generally put into very small applications. You can see kind of two pictures here, one on the left. This is a fairly standard unit. You have a, you know, you have a vertical centrifugal pump in a tank. And then one on the right here is a more custom unit. But they're bringing a specific process in there uh, from a particular tool. And this is obviously like an all uh, higher end material construction. and an interoperated diaphragm pump based on what's actually flowing into it, but fundamentally they work exactly the same way. And when I say small, these units can be very small. This is this is a small unit which, which is essentially designed to slide directly under a sink. And you know you have a you basically have a footprint of a foot by a foot by a foot for the tank reservoir and a single pump on top with a two-point level switch, net level switch. If the pump is small enough, can actually just trip the relay for the pump itself, and you can actually just be plugged into a standard 110 outlet. And you have just a pump on and a pump off position. And these are fairly common applications for sort of a small, sort of standard simplex lift station. So, where are these used? I mentioned this obviously a few minutes ago. Often used under the sink, single processes, you know, because they don't have redundancy in them, they often do have things like high level alarms as an option, just because you really won't know if the pump actually failed in a lot of these applications. So that's a fairly common feature to add on to these types of systems. But simplex lift stations are generally only utilized in, in, in maybe non-critical applications or very small room for that, very small footprint applications. Where there just isn't room or necessity, or 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 the need to, to expend the much capital cost to put in a larger, um, more robust duplex style lift station. 
Duplex lift stations are by far and away the more common type of unit which you will see. And here again, you can see kind of two different units. The one on the, on the left is kind of a more standard kind of duplex unit. And the one on the right is a little more of a custom unit. The duplex lift station, fundamentally speaking, is, is, is similar to a simplex station in that you have a reservoir where you collect, you have a level control in there which monitors uh, the level in the tank to trigger the pumps. The difference being is that you have two pumps in this case. Uh, used typically for redundancy. And as a, as a water level rises, the first pump turns on. And very, very often these are set up in what's referred to as a lead lag configuration. And what that means is one pump, one pump is the primary pump and one pump is the secondary pump. And within the reservoir, your level controls are monitoring essentially four different set points. The lowest level being the pump off, all pumps off. As the water begins to rise, your, your lowest level pump on point activates your primary pump. Should the water continue to rise in the lift station, a third point higher up will trigger then the secondary pump. So you have both pumps running in operation. This is also, this will also happen if for some reason your first pump doesn't turn on. And then your fourth point would be like a high level alarm switch in that case. One thing to note, if both pumps are in, are in operation, you don't get double the flow. Generally speaking, most pumps, because, because of how steep the curves are of their flow to head ratio, you will get a fair amount of interference when you're operating both pumps. So you're really only going to get an increase in flow of approximately 25 to 30% if both pumps are in operation in that case. But typically speaking, the reason the second pump will operate is either A, in an emergency situation where you had a surge of fluid, or B, if, if, the primary pump, if the primary pump failed to operate. Another very common feature added into duplex lift station that is referred to it as, um, as referred to as an alternating feature. And alternating features allow the pumps to basically switch back and forth. So if one pump is the primary pump and it activates, the next time it activates the other that pump will then become the secondary pump. And that allows you to limit wear on the lift station as it operates going back and forth. And that one pump is constantly the lead pump in most cases. So looking at a standard duplex lift station, it looks fairly similar to a simplex. Obviously you have the two pumps there uh, and you have the three different points I just described. This one not showing the high level alarm switch. You have both pumps off lead pump on, flag pump on, and then above that could also be an optional high level alarm. Again, just due to the fact that you have two pumps, if the pumps are mounted on the actual lift station vessel, the tank itself does need to be much bigger. So generally speaking, duplex configurations are only available um, on larger lift stations than, than will be a standard simplex. There are ways to do more custom duplex lift stations where you do have a reduced footprint, those get a little bit more into some, it'll get a little more into some custom geometry uh, and or some different pump technologies. Duplex lift stations do also tend to be used most often uh, when you have more critical processes. You have an entire floor, for, for example, or you're going to have very continuous flow and you just need to have built-in redundancy to your system. That's why you're going to use a duplex. And I would say in general, Probably 75% of all lift stations are duplex, and even a small amount of them are actually triplex for that reason, so that you have enough, um, so that you have that redundancy built in. Burr process equipment does offer a standard package of, of small to medium size, both simplex and duplex lift stations. And this information posted here is also available on the website as well. And you can see here these come in both polypropylene and polyethylene. And flow rates out from about you know low, you know, 5 GPM up to about 80 gallons per minute in both the simplex as well as the duplex configuration. As, you, as, as noted, the duplex configuration is only available once you get above the 30 gallon mark because you need more room to put a duplex configuration on the system. And this can be used a bit to generate part numbers. You can see here um, the standard tank volumes that we utilize go from seven to 260 gallons. Um, and there's different pump curves from one to eight. And then there's also a 12 and a 16, which are a little bit larger, as well as different voltages, single phase, very often used on simplex pumps up to three 
three phase four six these will for a lot of the larger pumps uh, and then a simplex as well as a duplex configuration which would allow an engineer uh, to basically directly specify one of these standard units these standard units come with uh, the option for a high level switch all duplex ones come with a standard duplex panel which includes a few disconnect pump motor starters the lag as well as all the many control features we just discussed um, in a, in a UL listed control panel box um, for a complete system. In addition to the standard ones, um, we, there is a number of different custom list stations that can be built depending on different applications. And a lot of the sort of fundamental aspects of list stations that we just discussed still apply here uh, when talking about custom list stations. What really comes into play in talking about custom list station can be the volume, different materials that are utilized, uh, pump materials, whether or not the unit is going to be in a hazardous duty location. If you're using the actual list station uh, for a different uh, for a different purpose, such as using it more as such as using it more as like an equalization tank. Um, so that's where a lot of the different custom applications come into play. You can even see here. You have a number of different pump technologies. The one in the upper uh, upper left hand corner has large stainless steel cell priming pumps. Uh, the one in the middle right there has uh, air operated diaphragm pumps. It's also a class one uh, div one unit. And the two on the bottom have a larger vertical uh, deep set and power pumps. Kind of how do we define what it, how, do, kind of how do we define a custom list station? And when I say custom, I mean these are basically built still to a standard. They're just utilizing pump technologies, controls, instrumentation, and really fits into a specific process application. And you know these flow rates can range from very small, like one GPM, such as that very small uh, one I showed you guys earlier, which was um, obviously uh, which, which was a simplex air operated diaphragm pump. Uh, up to a thousand gallon per minute systems where you're using much larger either cell primers or 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 like a deep sided power pump and say you're transferring waste out of an entire plant application in those cases. Also pump technology varies. Our standard units utilize a vertical centrifugal pump, but a lot of the a lot of the more custom units utilize horizontal centrifugal pumps. They utilize horizontal cell priming mag drive pumps. Uh, which is very common if you have a lift station, for example, buried uh, or located deep in a pit and access or confined space to getting down there to access the pumps can be difficult. You put more of a cell priming pump on there. Positive displacement pumps or, or for example, air operated diaphragm pumps are very common uh, for all the same reasons. One, they are cell priming. Two, they have the ability uh, to move some level of solids or slurry if that's going to be present in your system. Uh, gear pumps, uh, deep set vertical pumps. And if you have very high amount of solids, for example, even some pumps can be utilized in those applications. Very often those some pumps are utilized um, with stainless steel or high temperature options, particularly on the process side of things just because most sump pumps in general aren't rated for high temperatures or to be sitting in uh, what could potentially be an, you know, an acidic or a caustic waste stream. And then tank geometries come into play here as well. Um, how big is the tank? Tank size ranging from very small, you know, like seven gallons up to 15,000 gallons um, in different materials as well. You know, stainless materials are polypropylene and polyethylene. Um, simply because of their strength as well as their capabilities um, with things such as um, you know, acid bases or the process chemicals which could be entering into the lift station. Um, but, from, but, but for example, PDF is very commonly used in semiconductor applications where they're going to see a lot of nitric or hydrochloric acid. Stainless steel is utilized very often. You're going to see like direct steam condensate coming into your system which could spike the temperature up to say over 210 degrees. Um, even Hasselhoff C and fiberglass are also utilized but for a lot of the same reason that you have very high temperature waste coming into a lift station um, or, or more unique type of, um, of type of chemistry. For example, Hasselhoff C, you have very high chloride waste um, at a higher temperature coming into your system as well. So 
there's kind of a lot of things that can go into making up a custom list station. So that kind of highlights a lot of a lot of the sort of main points. But it's probably best just to look at a few different examples here, which would really show um, kind of you know, really really what I mean by really by what I mean by a custom list station. This one here is a double wall PVDF lift station. This is, this is, this is, I mentioned before, is utilized with semiconductors um, for um, HF waste. HF waste is very commonly utilized uh, when doing semiconductor etching. So because of the safety concerns and handling uh, hydrofluoric acid, um, which is a level four skin contact uh, warning chemical, this entire lift station is double contained. It has splash uh, and spray protection as well. We have leak sensors, um, you know, the inoperative diaphragm pumps, which have the ability of a very high suction draw, so you can really pump the entire tank down. You have tank, you have tank leak monitoring. And again, because of the critical nature of this, you have a more robust control scheme. Um, you have a PLC-based control system here, which can communicate back to the BAS system with the knowing these alarms, shut down upstream processes in that case um, as well. But at its heart, it's still just a basic duplex lift station. It just has the added safety features involved because of the technology, because of the waste coming into it. Um, and it is a unique material. It's going to be PVDF just because of the chemical compatibility of the different waste streams coming into it. If you if you if your lift station needs to be located in like a clean room environment, for example. Um, you may want to put it in build a cabinet. Um, this, you know, stainless steel comes into play. That's be more of a wash down application. Um, PEMV motors to eliminate uh, particles, for example, coming out of your system. Um, this is kind of more of an example. This is actually a full duplex wood station, um, full air pneumatic located in a cabinet. So that basically also eliminates a lot of the different noise and vibration coming out of your lift station, um, just based on where it's located in your actual facility. Again, and then it's obviously just taking um, essentially one of the more standard kind of configurations about scaling it up to a much larger flow rate. So in this case here, this is actually taking a pharmaceutical plant waste and that instantaneous flow rate is 250 GPM. So again, based on the residency time we were talking about earlier of three to five minutes, this would put you about 1250 gallon tank all stainless steel, just because you're in a pharmaceutical environment, in this case, PLC controlled, um, in, um, along with DFDs in this case for power efficiency and for monitoring of the system. And this would then be utilized to transfer into um, the drain or into potentially like a wastewater treatment system downstream of your application to allow for better treatment. This one here, because it is actually transferring into a pH system, they're actually using it for pH monitoring as well. Um, and using it more as a um, really utilize that for speed forward control uh, going into a package wastewater neutralization system. And you can kind of see here um, the PNID for a unit like this. You have a tank, level of transmitters in this case, because you have adjustability in the set points. That's very important if you're trying to control flow downstream to your system. This is one of those cases where you actually would potentially want to control flow, uh, as opposed to just sizing it for kind of that blanket 10% flow um, over your normal uh, maximum in, um, inflow uh, to allow uh, for better control going downstream to your pH system. Two sets of pumps, uh, pressure switch to monitor for pump failure, pump clean out ports uh, downstream uh, as well. And then, and then obviously custom decisions come into play a lot when you also have to do things that are based on different drainage um, limits. So this is kind of one that's really more custom just because of the area it has to go in. It's a fairly high flow, but it's coming into, but they, so they need a fairly large tank, uh, but you're basically putting this um, um, down into basically a pit, uh, basically putting it down um, into a pit at that point. So you have this kind of longer tank, and this is more, this is more like the cell priming style pumps, um, which would be utilized here to basically draw out of a tank like that. Uh, it's a double wall construction uh, for leak containment. 
EN have ultrasonic non-contact level in this case, and then like a duplex pump arrangement as well. As I mentioned earlier, not all lift stations are necessarily utilized for waste streams. Uh, this is more of an example of a lift station which is actually utilized to transfer chemical into a CGMP area. In this case, here is actually using a pharmaceutical application. They're transferring glycol uh, into a process area. This is a simplex style lift station in this case. Um, they have, there, there, there are two pumps obviously in the picture shown. One is for transfer into the lift station vessel. And the second one on top is for transfer into the actual uh, into the actual process room. <coughs> Excuse me. Be because of the nature of what this is transferring, since you're obviously using this into a CGMP area, everything is FDA approved plastics, open or welded, sanitary design, um, sanitary um, um, air operated transfer pumps um, as well. And again, this is only a simplex application more because it's really holding the pressure line to the actual system as opposed to doing true transfer um, in this case. Looking at a P and ID of this, kind of going from a, from a, from a, a, a left to right, uh, you can see there the pump which is coming out here of the drum, transferring into the tank. And then you have the pump here, which is drawing out, which is then going into um, basically like a hydrodynamic vessel, which is actually holding pressure as this goes into the CGMP area. That's just a kind of a brief overview of a lot of the, of a lot of the different custom lift stations that are available. Um, and I've given the time frame for the webinar. Um, you know, there are many, many more examples that we could be going through. Uh, but I just kind of wanted to highlight really just kind of the basics here, kind of like, you know, larger tanks, different processes, hazardous waste, to really kind of highlight how these different systems are actually utilized. Kind of a subset of custom list stations is more like solvent or hazardous location list stations. As you can see a picture of here. And these are a little bit different than just a standard list station. What I mean by a solvent? Um, is really any kind of a chemical uh, which is admissible in water that may or may not be flammable or, or, may, or, may, have, or, or may give up a VOC in that case. And these cannot be combined obviously into more of a, into more of a water-based drainage system that are typically handled separately. And because of the nature of their waste, very often um, they are uh, class one div one, class one div two. They have built-in fire suppression systems. The one, up, the one in the upper left-hand corner uh, is a cabinet-based design uh, for the collecting and basically in drums for transfer out or transfer in. And those have self-closing doors in the event of a fire uh, within the actual unit. They'll have nitrogen purging uh, in that case as well to basically prevent the atmosphere. Now they have conservation vents, as you can see there on top of the actual drums and flame arresters. And then, there, and then also the one on the right here is more of just a standard lift station. It has a lot of the same features, um, the explosion proof componentry, as well as the um, flame arresters and nitrogen purging as well. And these systems can also be made fairly small, like a simplex style unit here. Um, this is more of a cabinet based system instead of a large duplex one. This is actually more for a simplex. This one's actually about the size of a standard microwave. Um, it has many of the same features as well. Um, and um, this, and, and, and then, and then, um, and then, um, and um, these kind of systems uh, will be, and then, you know, these kinds of will be utilized kind of like, you know, very similar to how the point of use um, when these smaller simplex flow stations are utilized as well. So um, that concludes the webinar. Uh, coming up on May 20th, we do have a one-hour chemical feed systems webinar. Uh, and then I'll be talking a little bit more about solvent systems uh, in June, and then also come back in September uh, for a high-purity water system design as well. And there should be registration links up, which will be attached to the survey if you did find this webinar to be useful. Um, we do have a few questions here that I do want to go through. The first question is for the standard list stations, how much access space is needed and is access required on all four sides? 
the answer is you you really don't need that much access space for a list station. You would generally only need access on one side for the most part. Two would be preferable. The back of a standard lift station can always be against the wall. Uh, if it's a simplex style lift station, they can be located, you really only need one side of access because you just need access to be able to lift the pump out if necessary. Uh, there's very often they're located in things like cabinets um, or, or for example, under sinks. Duplex, you generally want one or two sides of access so you can get at the pump as well as level controls. But again, a lot of times these, these, systems, these systems are actually put in the pits. Their only true access is actually from the top. They can literally almost be enclosed on four sides if you do have direct top access. We have another question here. Do pump lift stations typically operate in a similar capacity to how booster pump packs are as far as flow configuration? And I think what the question is really asking is like, for example, a lot of the booster pump packs, um, you will run them and you'll have like one or two or three pumps and you'll run them at some like 35% capacity for each. You generally don't do that with lift stations. And part of the reason being is a lot of the different pumps which are utilized, um, at least in more of these process or waste-based lift stations, um, aren't really designed to be run on a BFD curve like that, as opposed to like a city water booster pump pack, um, which utilizes um, which utilizes more, which utilizes, which utilizes like vertical centrifugal pumps, which are very easy to BFD um, and allow you to kind of operate um, into a larger flow curve. These just really aren't quite allowed to do that. We have another question here. Are pump lift stations um, utilized or interchangeable uh, with equalization tanks? And the answer is yes, um, they certainly can be. And what that really, so what an equalization tank is, equalization tank is a, is a process vessel uh, in which fluid uh, enters into the tank, um, is stored, and then is allowed to be transferred uh, to a downstream processing by a pump system. And that's usually more of a controlled transfer, um, where you're going to basically use that as kind of a holding volume. But fundamentally, it's very similar to a trans um, to a lift station. And a lift station can be configured to operate as an equalization tank. You will just have to size um, the you just have to size um, the lift station uh, tank more appropriately than you would if you were just transferring. You have to actually size it um, to have that built-in equalization volume. One more question here. What type of materials would you recommend uh, for extreme pH or extreme temperature applications? So if you have extreme temperature applications, um, you can you would generally you know, my extreme, I'm assuming we're talking about things like steam condensator or the like, you generally go with a stainless steel lift station. Um, but um, as far as the um, higher, as far as the more extreme pH applications, it does vary a little bit. Um, you know, a lot of times if you have a combination of high temperature um, and more extreme pH, stainless steel may or may not be a good alternative, uh, just because of the corrosivity of some acids and bases to stainless steel. That's where you're looking at things like fiberglass potentially. Although fiberglass itself can be very weak to caustic, to different caustic streams. So it really does come down to an application basis. PDVS is sometimes utilized as well um, because it has a temperature above, uh, above the actual boiling point. Or even in more extreme cases, I've even seen coated tanks like Teflon coated stainless steel tanks um, also be utilized. We have another question here for centrifugal pumps. Check valves before or after the pumps, which is a better solution. Um, I generally put check valve after the pump, but it does depend on the type of pump that you're actually utilizing. Um, so in this case, for example, in in those with better type of pump technology, using more of a self priming pump, they'll be before and after check valves, because they'll actually use them the whole prime. Um, but there isn't real, I, I generally like to do it just because generally I want to, I generally, we generally put them after the pump as opposed to before the actual pump. Um, but I don't think there's really necessarily a right or wrong way to do that. 
And all right, everyone, I think that's the, all the questions we have for now. Again, I will be, you can certainly feel free to email me, Mark Trigenti of Bird Process Equipment, if any other questions come up. And uh, this presentation has been recorded and it will be available uh, to those who ask uh, for viewing as well as a, a PDF co a copy if you'd like further review. Again, thank you for joining us. I hope everyone's doing well during this difficult time. Thanks and have a great afternoon.